remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. And one of the criticisms that we in the conservative movement, we on the right, often get is that for some reason, we who are conservatives are behind on so-called women's issues. That because of our positions on these so-called women's issues, that conservatives are unfair towards women or we uh, uh, aren't in favor of equality, we're in favor of kind of an inequality sort of situation. And it's a, it's a criticism we get quite often. And in fact, after the State of the Union address last uh, last Tuesday night, a lot of the uh, a lot of the feedback on Twitter and social media was about how Barack Obama did such a great job of identifying with women's issues during that speech. Well, what I wanted to do today was I wanted to go through and address these so-called women's issues and demonstrate to you how conservatives are not in favor of any sort of unfairness towards women, how really such unfairness really doesn't even exist to a meaningful degree, and how in a lot of ways we are for equality. Now. When I talk about women's issues, what am I talking about? In 2014, generally, when people talk about women's issues, it comes down to three topics. Equal pay for equal work, birth control, and abortion. And there may be some other things you can put in under that umbrella, but most of the time, when people bring up the term women's issues, they're gonna talk about one of those three things or some combination of them. So I wanna go through each one of those items and demonstrate for you how the conservative position on each of them is completely fair to women. Let's talk about equal pay for equal work first. Now, I will admit this much. Of the three topics we're gonna talk about, this is the one that if you don't think it through, when you just hear what the liberals say about it on face value, you might be tempted to think, hey, that kind of makes sense. When you listen to the State of the Union address and you hear Barack Obama make the statement that women make 77 cents on the dollar when compared to men in today's work environment, your first thought is probably, that's unfair. Oh my God, we've got to do something about that. But when you actually think it through and take it to its conclusion, you'll notice that Barack Obama is taking that number and, and not really putting it into context for you. And I, I don't mean to single out Barack there. All kinds of liberals do it. And even independents who don't know any better do it. They're taking a number like that, 77 cents in the dollar compared to men, and taking it out of context. They're not giving you the full story. I want to give you the full story here. For example, did you realize that even though women make 77 cents in the dollar when compared to men, that nevertheless, since 1971, women who worked continuously from high school through their 30s ended up making more than single men who did the same? Probably didn't know that, did you? Kind of turns things around a little bit. You see, there's a number of differences between men and women here. And we say, when we say women make 77 cents on the dollar compared to men, we're not actually comparing apples to apples here. And I'm, I'm not telling you that genders are different in terms of their capabilities. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that there's a lot of differences in the work experience and work life of both genders. For example, it is far more common, and this is statistically based, you can look it up, it's far more common for women to have interruptions in their career than it is for men. A lot of women give birth to children, so maybe they go out on maternity leave for a while, or in a lot of cases, women will you know, drop out of the workforce to raise their kids for a period of time and then come back. Well, the result of that is, then in many cases, if let's say you're an employer and you have a job coming down to a 35-year-old male applicant and a 35-year-old female applicant, in many cases, that 35-year-old female applicant will have been in the workforce for a shorter period of time because there might have been two or three years that she was out of action. So that male comes in with more experience. Therefore, his, his effort, his, his labor, his productivity is worth more. Likewise, if you've got, let's say, a 20-year-old man competing for a job with a 20-year-old woman, and you're an employer, you know that statistically speaking, and biologically speaking, the female is far more likely to go on a maternity leave at some point during her employment than the male is, since the male, you know, can't have a kid. So you know there's likely going to be a period of time for that female employee that you're going to be paying for her on maternity leave, and you're getting no productivity in, in return. Well, yeah, of course you're gonna take that money out on the front end, most likely, and offer her a lower salary to compensate for that. And that's not all. Did you realize that even though a lot of people frame this as an equality argument, 
The type of jobs that men and women often are drawn to, or they apply for, or that they even take, are not equal. Not at all. Men often take far more uh, dangerous jobs than women do. In fact, did you realize that even though men are only 54% of the total workforce, 92% of all job-related deaths happen to men? It's true. Contrast that to the side of the coin. There's a lot of areas where there are lower paying jobs where women go to those jobs in higher percentages than men. Things like teachers and social workers and things like that. So if you've got a higher number of women going for jobs that are less dangerous and that are less paying, of course women as a whole are going to be paid less than men. If you have women dropping out of the workforce for periods of time where men largely don't, of course women are going to be paid less than men because what they bring to the table is different and is less so. There's no unfairness there at all. Okay, let's go on to birth control. Uh, you may remember this from last year, the so-called war on women, that uh, liberals left and right would try to convince you and they would tell you that conservatives wanted to ban birth control. Those evil conservatives wanted to take the choices away from women and ban all their birth control. Is that really true? Did you ever once hear any conservative politician, pundit, commentator, make the suggestion or, or, or say that birth control should be banned? No, you didn't hear any of us say that. Did you hear any of us say, we need to take birth control off the shelves at Walmart. We need to, we need to prohibit pharmacists from selling birth control. No, you never heard that whatsoever. Not at all. What you did hear was that our beef is simply with the government forcing people to pay for the birth control of others, especially when those who would be footing the bill for the birth control have a moral or religious issue with the concept of birth control to begin with. That's it. That's all. It was really that innocuous. Nobody was going around trying to ban birth control. Now, in the spirit of equality, since that's such a big buzzword on these women's issues, in the spirit of equality, let's put the shoe on the other foot. Let us say that I, a single male, go out to a bar one night. And I pick up a young lady there, and I decide I'm going to bring her back to my place and, as Bob Eubanks used to say, make whoopee. Now, what would you think in that situation if I'm walking out of the bar with this girl and I stop, I stop at someone's table over here, someone I don't know, and I tap this guy at the table on the shoulder and say, hey, I'm taking this girl home, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make mad, passionate monkey love to her, buy me a box of condoms. It would be the most ridiculous idea in the world. The guy would probably punch me in the face, and he would be well within reason to do so. Well, what I've just described for you is exactly what the Sandra Flukes of the world and these feminists who want insurance and churches to pay for birth control, that's exactly what they're suggesting. We have no problem with birth control, most of us. You want to buy birth control? Buy birth control. Buy all of it you want to. Buy whatever kind you want to. We really don't care. Just don't ask me to pay for it. I wouldn't ask you to pay for my condoms, would I? Of course not. No unfairness there. Okay, finally, let's talk about the third of these topics. Let's talk about abortion. And this is the one that gets people upset, I know it. But we got to talk about it. They try to talk about abortion as though it's a fairness issue, it's a choice issue. We're going we're to throw that away right now. Just as honest as I can be right here, i, I got to tell you that I don't see how the killing of babies for convenience especially when you consider half of the babies that are killed are going to be girls, I don't see how the killing of babies of convenience would be considered a women's issue. That doesn't make sense to me. It seems to me that such an issue would be better labeled as a pediatric health issue, you know, since it's the babies who are actually losing their lives. Call me crazy. Now, some of you are jumping up and down right now and, and yelling about, what about rape and incest? What about abortion in the case of rape and incest? You're such an ogre, you're such a monster. Relax there. Hold your granny panties, all right? First of all, less than 1% of all abortions occur because of rape or incest, all right? So it's a pretty small number. And while I think reasonable people can disagree on the idea of whether abortion should be available for rape or incest, personally, I believe that abortion should be outlawed even in cases of rape or incest. As horrific as those crimes are, I don't believe that killing a baby is the right response to them. You want to come to talk to me about killing the perpetrator? I'm good with that. Let's not kill the baby. But that, that, that's where I come from on it. But nevertheless, I think that's something that reasonable people can disagree on. In any case, those cases are such a small and minute number of the overall number of abortions that they're really not worth spending a lot of time talking about. They're really not worth letting ourselves get bogged down in in the discussion. 
What we need to be talking about is the 90 plus percent of abortions that are done for convenience. Gee, maybe we should talk about those. Now again, many feminists, many people who are pro-abortion try to frame this as an argument about choice, an issue of choice. But is that true? Not from where I sit, because women have a lot of choices when it comes to the conception of children. Women have the choice of who they sleep with. Women have the choice of when they decide to sleep with someone or when they don't decide to sleep with them. Women have the choice of when they decide to engage in sexual relations to begin with. In other words, whether to make the choice of waiting to engage in sex until after they have their education and a good job and income and so forth. I'm not even talking about the religious arguments here, folks. I mean, I could. They'd be pretty compelling, but you don't even have to go there. I'm talking about simply women having choices as to whether they engage in sexual behavior and the, the possibility of conceiving children before or after they actually have their lives set up in terms of income and infrastructure and so forth. In other words, they have plenty of choices and really they have as many choices and the same choices that men have. Women have the choice of using birth control, as do men. Women have the choice of engaging in sexual relations when they're not in a position to raise a child, as men do. Women have the choice of putting off sexual relations until they're financially feasible and ready, as men do. There's no unfairness here. There's no inequality here. In short, so much of the topics that the left puts under the umbrella of women's issues really are not women's issues at all. They are actually issues that affect us all. And that moreover, they are not issues to which women have some inherent degree of unfairness. We've already seen that if women stay in the workforce as long as a man does, they'll be paid what a man is, maybe more. We've already seen that women can buy as much birth control as they want, just like a man can. We've already seen that women have all of the same all of the same choices that a man does in terms of conceiving children. So really there is no war on women and even worse, I think it is patronizing and sad and disgusting that many on the left want women to think that they are so helpless that they cannot fend for themselves and cannot make it without government giving them the helping hand, without government buying their birth control or letting them kill children for convenience or forcing employers to pay them a wage which they have not earned, which in the long run will only kill off jobs, it's not fair at all. We on the right are in favor of equality, but what we're telling you is as far as genders go, equality already exists. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.